Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the CFP Board's Business Update webinar. I'm uh, Tim Coaches, your host today. For those of you who may not know me, uh, I have been a practicing financial planner for 40 years and have been involved in the industry in lots of different ways, including service on the CFP Board uh, from its founding in 1985 through 1996 and uh, more recently with the FPSB, the international um, uh, CFP marks holder at its founding in 2004, and I've recently rejoined the board of the FPSB in April of this year. So welcome, everyone. We're broadcasting live from San Francisco, where the CFP boards has uh, just wrapped up its regular July meeting. Uh, during today's webinar, we'll hear from uh, the CFP Board about its recent activities, including its work on public policy issues, uh, collaborative efforts with the Financial Planning Coalition with regard to the legislative proposal that would establish an SRO to oversee investment advisors. We'll also hear about CFP Board's oversight of CFP professionals with recent updates to the CFP Board's enforcement uh, process. We'll learn about the latest research on the impact of CFP Board's first large-scale national public awareness campaign to increase awareness of the CFP certification. And we'll spend some time on the CFP Board's activities to advance the standards for CFP certification, the four E's, education, examination, experience, and ethics. We've received a number of questions in advance of today's program, and we'll try to get to all of those during the webinar. Uh, during today's event, if you experience issues with the audio for this pre presentation, or if it appears that the slides displayed don't match up with what we're speaking about at the time, try refreshing your webinar console by pressing F5 on your PC keyboard, or if you're using a Mac, Command-R. If you're on Twitter and want to post about today's event, use hashtag CFPBoardBUW. Please use the question and answer function on your screen to ask questions of our panelists. You may submit your question at any time during this program, and we'll try to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the program. If the panel does not get to your question today during the broadcast, uh, they will be recorded and the CFP board will follow up to provide an answer. So uh, let's get started. Joining us today are the uh, chair of CFP board's board of directors, Alan Goldfarb, and uh, the chair elect of the CFP board of directors, Nancy Kistner. Thank you, Tim. And the CFP board CEO, Kevin Keller. Tim, good to be in your hometown. Yeah, thank you for coming. Welcome, Alan, Nancy, and Kevin. Uh, Alan, you've just finished up the latest meeting of the Board of Directors, which I'm sure covered a lot of ground. They always do. What updates from today's meeting would you like to highlight? Uh, well, Tim, uh, you could say we had a busy few days. We've been involved in meetings for the last day and a half. And our agenda for this webinar covers a number of the updates that we addressed at the Board meeting. The board also spent time looking forward. We took a long look at our strategic plan, the house, which you see up on the screen, is a visual representation of our strategic plan through 2014. It sets out the board's core objectives as they flow from the organization's mission. And Kevin and the CFP board staff focuses their work on activities that further this mission. I believe the board has set out ambitious set of goals for the organization, and there are many opportunities before the CFP board, as well, unfortunately, as some challenges. This week, we received updates on CFP board's operations and current initiatives. We had preliminary discussions on a number of potential activities CFP board may undertake in 2013, and all of us on the board know that the CFP board has an important role to play and that its important work is still yet to be done. It is rewarding to see the good progress we've made on so many fronts at this point. Thank you, Alan. Kevin, uh, can you fill us in on what's been happening on the policy front? 
Jim, you know, I'd really be happy to. This has been an area where we at the staff level have been um, quite busy. As you know, uh, CFP Board is working closely on many policy issues with our partners of the Financial Planning Coalition. That includes our friends at FPA and at NAPFA. Through the joint efforts of our coalition partners, the CFP professional community and other allies, we have worked to give the financial planning profession a strong and unified voice on these important policy issues. And you know, Tim, when, when, before the coalition came about, uh, uh, about three years ago, there wasn't a unified voice, and uh, the coalition's been so helpful in that area. We've had some successes. Uh, the timing of our collaboration coincided with the start of the discussion around the financial regulatory reform known as Dodd-Frank, and uh, so we've been working uh, uh, hard ever since. The coalition's work helped lead to the inclusion of three important provisions within the Dodd-Frank bill. One provision required the GAO, or the Government Accountability Office, to complete a study on the regulation of financial planners. Another, which in Washington we refer to as Section 913, doesn't that sound like Washington? Speak? Sure does. <laughs> Section 913 of the Dodd-Frank Bill authorized the SEC to conduct a six-month study to evaluate the effectiveness of existing legal and regulatory standards, uh, standards of care for broker-dealers and investment advisors for providing personalized financial investment advice. That provision also authorized the SEC to <clears throat> initiate rulemaking to establish a fiduciary standard for broker-dealers if needed. And then finally, the third provision, Section 914 of Dodd-Frank, directed the SEC to evaluate the need for enhanced oversight uh, of investment advisors and then make recommendations to Congress. So our activity in the recent months has focused primarily on Section 914 uh, on investment advisor oversight issues. The, sections, uh, the SEC's Section 914 study uh, recognized that the SEC was really unable to maintain sufficient rates of examination because it lacked the resources to keep up with the growth in the advisor industry. Currently, uh, the SEC is able to examine investment advisors on average of only about once every 11 years. And I think there's a, a, a uniformity of uh, a conclusion that you know, this is a problem, not only for investors, but also for uh, advisors. Now, the study that was conducted as part of Dodd-Frank on this issue presented three options to Congress to consider to help remedy that uh, problem. One was, one option, the first option, was to impose user fees on investment advisors to fund increased oversight at the SEC. Uh, the second uh, option presented uh, for Congress's consideration would be to authorize the SEC to recognize one or more SROs to oversee investment advisors, and then the third was to authorize FINRA to examine dual registrants. So, Kevin, what is the um, CFP boards and the Financial Planning Coalition's preference among those three choices? Well, the uh, Financial Planning Coalition uh, really, value, uh, really has uh, zeroed in on the first option, the option of imposing user fees on investment advisors to fund increased oversight. We really believe that retaining oversight at the SEC is the right regulatory uh, outcome. Last month, the House of Representatives Committee on Financial Services held a hearing on legislation that would take a very different approach, in fact. Um, the Investment Advisor Oversight Act of 2012 was introduced by Congressman Bacchus of Alabama and Chair of the House Financial Services Committee and Congresswoman McCarthy from New York. Basically, uh, that legislation would authorize the SEC to recognize one or more SROs to oversee investment advisors. That was the second option that, was, uh, that came out of the FCC study. And it's no secret uh, that FINRA would likely be the choice uh, if that option were to come to pass. 
So we worked with our coalition partners to issue a very strong statement to the House Committee opposing the legislation as it currently stands. We're in agreement that increasing uh, examiner oversight, investment advisor oversight is necessary. However, uh, we all agree that an SRO would not be a good solution. It would be costly, especially for small investment advisory firms, and it would likely impact the advisory services made uh, available to the public. Our statement with the coalition outlines a very different solution. And to walk through that, we believe that authorizing the SEC to collect user fees would allow the SEC to ramp up examinations of investment advisors and that that would be the most cost-effective and efficient solution. One, it would really have no impact on taxpayers or the cost of government because the user fees would come from uh, investment advisors. It would be more cost-effective than establishing an entirely new regulatory structure and user fees would impact investment advisors consistently rather than placing an undue burden on smaller firms. We believe this approach really is the best way to serve the American public and bring investment advisor oversight to where it needs to be. You know, the, the question of cost has been at the forefront of these de debates from when the initial SEC study came out. To provide an objective look at the potential costs uh, for a new SRO, the CFP board, our financial planning coalition partners, and other industry organizations commissioned the Boston Consulting Group to provide an independent economic analysis of the oversight options in that Section uh, 914 study. And the results of the Boston Consulting Group's analysis showed that a new FINRA-based SRO for investment advisors would be costly, especially for smaller advisory firms, and would have uh, a real impact on their retail clients. Can you tell us a little bit more about that analysis, uh, Kevin? Indeed. The, the BCG, or the Boston Consulting Group, uh, studied each of the three core scenarios informed by the Section 914 study uh, of options. and. Then the BCG developed economic models for these scenarios based on publicly available information from the SEC, FINRA, and other organizations, and with the assumption that investment advisors would be examined once uh, every four years. Among other things, um, the study included several what we think are very key findings. First, uh, creating an SRO for investment advisors would likely cost twice as much as funding an enhanced SEC examination program. Second, the study found that funding an SRO would likely cost investment advisors at least twice as much as funding enhanced SEC examinations. And I guess in other words, an advisor would have to pay membership fees to FINRA that would roughly be twice the amount of user fees it would need to pay the SEC. Now concurrent with this economic study, BCG also concluded, or rather conducted, an online study uh, of a st statistically significant and representative sample of investment advisors across the country. Among other things, the survey showed that advisors have a strong preference for the SEC versus FINRA oversight. A full 80% of investment advisors preferred the SEC over a FINRA IASRO. If you want to take a closer look at the full study and the survey, we've posted the results at uh, www.cfp.net forward slash advocacy. We believe this information is essential to Congress's decision on this issue, and we've been meeting with representatives on, the, uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, to discuss the findings and the implications. Uh, this is a really a hugely important issue, and it's likely to have a direct impact on many CFP professionals and indirectly on their clients. Um, the uh, oversight, appropriate oversight of um, uh, financial advisors, financial planners, investment advisors, is really essential to strengthening the public's confidence in our profession. Uh, I understand, uh, Alan, that the CFP board also has a number of initiatives underway to strengthen its enforcement 
of the standards of professional conduct. Is that right, Alan? Yeah, we do, Tim. I'm glad you asked. Uh, you know, frankly, our active enforcement of the standards of professional conduct is essential to the value of the CFP certification. It really differentiates CFP certification from the many other designations out there in the financial services industry, the ABCs, as we refer to. Uh, in 2011, we completed an enforcement audit that took a close look at the CFP Board's enforcement process. It looked for ways to uphold our goal of having an enforcement process that is expedient, consistent, and fair to all participants and also credible to the public. We're working through the recommendations now that resulted from the audit. In the fall of 2011, we released a public comment of a number of proposed amendments to the disciplinary rules and procedures. A number of the proposed changes focused on the interim suspension procedures. This allows us to suspend an individual certification when the CFP board has credible evidence that a CFP professional has engaged in conduct that poses an immediate threat to the public. Interim suspensions remain in effect until the matters under investigation have been reviewed by the Disciplinary Ethics Commission through their standard process. It's an important provision that helps protect the reputation of the CFP marks. The board adopted the amendments in April of 2012, and they took effect last month. Again, at the start of 2012, we announced a public comment period for a proposal related to the way CFP board addresses bankruptcy filings by CFP professionals. In the past, bankruptcy filings were matters that CFP Board reviewed through our normal disciplinary process. Individuals who filed bankruptcy could end up at a hearing before the Disciplinary Ethics Commission. The new approach takes a public disclosure approach. The CFP Board will verify bankruptcy filings and then post information about the bankruptcy of the CFP Board professional on their profile on their website, on the CFP Board's website specifically. The CFP board professionals with a single bankruptcy filing within the previous five years and no other matters requiring view, there will be no disciplinary investigation. The board adopted the new bankruptcy disclosure process in April of 2012. We believe the new process benefits the public by making consumers aware of any CFP board professional who has filed a bankruptcy. It is also consistent with the CFP board's professional obligation under the rules of conduct to disclose such a bankruptcy filing in, to a client or even a prospective client. And the process took effect on July 1st. When you use the CFP board search on our website, you'll also see disclosures on bankruptcy filings in, from their individual public records. The CFP board held a webinar in May to share more information about the recent changes, and if you missed it, you can find a recording on our website from the recent events section at the, at the bottom of the home page. In spring this year, we also announced a public comment period for a draft of proposed sanction guidelines. The sanction guidelines set out specific types of conduct and a violation of CFP Board of Standards professional conduct and a list of disciplinary types and sanctions related to that particular discipline. It's intended to help the Disciplinary Ethics Commission and our Appeals Committee in maintaining consistency with the sanctions imposed for similar offenses. As you know, Tim, I served on and at one time was chair of the CFP Board's Professional Review, which is now the Disciplinary Ethics Commission, and I know how seriously everyone on the Commission takes its obligations. In every case which is reviewed individually on a case-by-case -case basis, it is essential that the decisions made in light of the bigger picture and those are the decisions that the Commission continues to make. We have anonymous case histories that have been helpful in doing just that. I believe the sanction guidelines will be very helpful. The Board reviewed the comments on the proposed guidelines this week and additional information will be soon announced. We really do appreciate everyone who took time to provide those comments on these proposals. And we have additional proposals released later this year, and we hope you'll take the time equally to review those proposals and share your feedback. The Board values your feedback, and the recent changes we have adopted are better as a result of that feedback. 
Thank you very much, Alan. I suspect that uh, the CFP Board's enforcement process is not everybody's favorite topic, but it really is an essential part of the CFP Board's work to benefit the public. Um, we just can't not do that. It's really very important. It's, it's one of our most important efforts because that gives us the credibility with the public and with the people in Washington relative to what we do. Absolutely. I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit and, and go to Nancy. Uh, Nancy, what updates can you provide on the CFP Board's work to ensure that the public understands the value of professional financial planning and recognizes CFP certification? Thanks, Tim. We, we've got a lot on this front to share with you today. Public awareness is most definitely one of the Board's big priorities, and it's something that we really truly believe is essential for the future of CFP certification and the financial planning profession. You know, our first large-scale public awareness campaign involving advertising got underway just over a year ago in uh, April of 2011, so we are now well into the campaign second year. Uh, the campaign includes a 30-second television advertisement that's been broadcast on national television cable networks, which include AMC, we've got CNN, ESPN, Fox News, HDTV, the History Channel, MSNBC, and even the Travel Channel. So it's pretty exciting, a lot of exposure. And along with the TV ads, the campaign includes advertising in other types of media. There are print ads, which you can actually see on the slide in the center row that have, been, have appeared in many financial magazines, such as Kiplinger's and Money, as well as weekend editions of the Wall Street Journal, which is quite popular. And we have several sets of online ads that have appeared on many other online properties. We've even gone so far as to use paid search postings related to hundreds of keyword combinations focused on typical terms that prospective clients would use when they're searching on Google or Bing or Yahoo. So for example, our online ads can appear after someone searches for words like retirement or inheritance or estate planning. And in addition, the TV spot and other advertisements direct people to our consumer website. So if you're not aware of it, this is an important place. It's a great portal. The website address is letsmakeaplan.org. And they can learn more about the CFP certification and even look up a CFP professional in their area. In addition to that, the letsmakeaplan.org microsite, which you see here, features resources about financial planning as well as certification. And the site has been seeing steady, steady growth in visitors, so we're thrilled about that and hopefully you are too because we're able to see evidence that this campaign is working. It's contributing to directing, it's really contributing directly to visitor numbers and that's key. Thanks, Nancy. We already have a number of uh, questions from the audience asking about results of the campaign. Um, what have you been able to measure so far? You know, effective measurements are crucial for the campaign, and that's something the board made sure was going to be a part of this whole deal. Otherwise, it wasn't going to be worth the effort. So our marketing team is capturing as much data as possible to measure the campaign's effectiveness. It's important for you to know in the board's resolution approving this campaign, we indicated there is going to be a formal review of our progress at the two-year mark. However, I must mention that we've been measuring the progress from the start, and that's been key. We've conducted significant consumer research as we set out to develop an effective campaign, and that research was very important and it provided guidance on the campaign's messaging as well as the design. So you may ask, so how do we measure this progress? With the advertisements leading to the letsmakeaplan.org website, we're able to track click-throughs click from the advertisements and we can gauge users' behavior on the website. So most importantly, the overall goal for the campaign is to increase awareness of CFP professionals. That's going to be our primary measure of success. And then to address that, we're doing a benchmarking study 
uh, it was actually conducted before the campaign's lot launch in April of 2011 because we needed to have a starting point to work off of and then move toward identifying where we're making progress. And actually just this week, the board reviewed the latest data on this progress and I'm pleased to be able to share where we stand with you today. So let's take a look at that. As far as uh, the new campaign results, the latest study conducted in April, as I said, around the one-year mark for the campaign, which was uh, delivered to us in a report in May, uh, this is the second major study we've done, and the good news is it's confirming we are having impact and we are positively moving awareness and preference for CFP professionals. The survey that was conducted online, and we did extensive interviews with more than 600 people from our target audience, so it's quite a sizable base. And the results show some positive awareness trends across the entire surveyed base. All right, Nancy, I thought maybe just here, this was an outside independent uh, firm. It wasn't CFP board. I just wanted to clarify in case there was any confusion that we had an outside firm not working for the advertising agency but completely independent that uh, is conducting this research for us. Thank you for uh, mentioning that, Kevin, and it also reminds us that we've got an outside perspective also giving us a true sense when we make moves in the survey results, they can share with us that perspective around what that really means because we're not in this kind of a business, so to speak, mm -hmm. so it's very helpful. Um, so looking at the awareness increases, remembering this is our first metric. Um, on the slide, you can see here the increases that have been measured for unaided awareness and top of mind awareness. So when it comes to awareness, we want people to think of CFP professionals first when they think of professionals who provide financial planning services. The total unaided awareness indicates people who mentioned CFP certification when they were asked what designations come to mind when they think of professionals who offer planning services. These are responses made without the benefit of a list or a suggested answer, so it's purely unaided. The top of mind awareness indicates the subset of the total unaided awareness number who mentioned CFP certification before any other designations for personal financial planning professionals. These percentage points that you'll see in the slide, the plus four and the plus three point increases over our baseline, they're great to see given that we're just one year into this campaign and clearly uh, given the exposure levels we've been able to reach with our limited resources is a very positive sign for us. That's great. What's uh, interesting is when the study looked at the responses of people with a higher level of investable assets, the increases are measurably higher and statistically significant, as you can see on the slide here. We saw a 3% increase from the baseline in top of mind awareness in the general population on the previous slide, and that increase has more than doubled for the segment of the population who are more likely to seek out a planner because they have a higher level of investable assets. Further, let's see, we've also uh, seen statistically significant signs of positive momentum in unaided awareness among the mass affluent initiator segment our advertising has been designed to reach, and that's really our target market. Um, our initial goals for the campaign are to increase awareness of CFP professionals amongst this mass affluent sector, and that's an important first step. But I also want to mention a longer-term goal of ours is to increase the public's preference for CFP professionals. So there's two sides to the equation. Shorter term, it's awareness. Longer term, it's preference for a CFP professional because this aligns overall with our vision and our mission to benefit the public. And we've been able to measure gains in this area already, which is really exciting. So in order for us to get relevant feedback in this area, the studies have asked people to indicate how appropriate and beneficial 
they consider CFP professionals to be for someone like me, for example. And potential clients see CFP professionals as more relevant in 2012 as compared to a year ago, which is a statistically significant increase. And similar to the increases we saw for awareness, our initial goal, this increase in preference is also higher for the segments with higher investable assets and the segments in our mass affluent market. So when the board authorized the campaign, we knew that our goals weren't something that could be reached overnight, but would require continued efforts. But the campaign so far is showing very positive signs. And it was authorized for a four-year period with a formal, formal evaluation at the two-year mark, as I mentioned before. I think everyone on the board was pleased to see this data on the effectiveness of the campaign, even as early as its first year, and hopefully you and our CFP professionals, as well as our stakeholders, feel that way as well. Tim, uh, there's one other item from the research I think our stakeholders will find important and want to see. As you know, the CFP board introduced a new mark along with the launch of the public awareness campaign. We call this the plaque design, uh, or the uh, gold bar. Uh, and it joins the family of other CFP certification marks, including the flame logo design, uh, which Nancy appreciates because we now have a gold pin or a silver pin to coordinate with her. <laughs> <laughs> All the advertising materials on, are on the Let's Make a Plan website. All feature the plaque designed prominently. Our measurement and public awareness campaign effectively included questions related to the awareness of the marks individually and collectively. And the study showed an increased recognition of the marks logo and recognition of the bar and plaque. The plaque design and the flame logo design is up significantly for recognition of both. And frankly, the plaque design had the highest recognition. Perhaps there was the fact that we amplified the gold standard with the gold bar and with our initials. So in short, the metrics show that the public awareness of the campaign is working. As Nancy mentioned, the board will conduct a formal evaluation of the campaign next year, following the two-year mark. And we look forward to sharing more information with you about the progress of the campaign. Uh, it's really great to see the work that the CFP board is doing to increase awareness of uh, CFP professionals, and it's really important for the financial planning uh, profession as a whole, as well as for each of us individually. Um, how can we individually help? What can we do to help? That's a great question, Tim. We hope that all CFP professionals will help us extend the reach, because that's critical. We all play a role here. Our advertising dollars are focused on national outlets, and there is much people can do to help share the campaign materials in their local communities. All of the campaign advertisements, as well as other resources, are available to you, so it's important that you know that in the Public Awareness Campaign Toolkit, which is on the CFP Board's website at www.cfp.net backslash or forward slash toolkit. <laughs> One of those slash. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention the toolkit includes things like a summary of the 2012 advertising schedule so you know what to expect coming down the pike. There are advertisements that you can customize, which is a nice option for your own use to help us extend our message. There are also video files and instructions for adding the online banners and the TV spot video to your website, which we've heard some of our CFP certificates have already done with much success in getting more out there. And then there's also downloadable artwork for the new CFP mark. So we hope that all CFP professionals will take the time to look at the toolkit materials because this is the way we're going to get the word out. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. It really looks like there's a lot of stuff there worth taking a look at. Kevin, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, you know, we, we really look at the communications in two buckets. We have our paid uh, advertising, of which the campaign is, is supporting. But I also want to point out that along the way, uh, along with that paid advertising, uh, we are supplementing that with our earned 
media, which would include our public relations and consumer outreach efforts. Uh, year to date in 2012, we've had significant media coverage of CFP board and CFP certification in our uh, activities, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of the results of that. To date, CFP board has issued uh, 20 news releases in 2012 and nearly 700 articles that have featured CFP certification or CFP board and its representatives have appeared. Now, uh, we measure the value of that with an outside firm. Uh, they tell us we've had over 700 million media impressions and have valued those impressions at over $39 million. So we're spending about $10 million, Tim, on the public awareness campaign. We're supplementing that with earned media, which to date is uh, almost four times uh, the paid advertising. Uh, we're really uh, working hard to establish a strong foundation in public awareness. Our consumer advocate and our 25 plus uh, CFP board ambassadors are out there sharing the message across the country. And uh, you also play a vital role in CFP board's ongoing work to increase awareness of the value of CFP certification. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, alongside uh, this work to increase awareness of CFP certification and, and the other topics we've covered today, uh, are there any other developments related to CFP certification requirements that we should be aware of? Tim, CFP Board is committed to ensuring that the CFP certification requirements remain strong and relevant uh, to the practice of financial planning. I want to highlight just a couple of items uh, related to maintaining your CFP certification. When we announced uh, the board's decision authorizing the public awareness campaign back in November of 2010, we also announced the introduction of uh, an additional fee for recertification. CFP professionals continue to renew their certification every two years, just like you've always done. What year did you become certified, Tim? 1991. So just like you've done every two years uh, since 1991. Uh, and uh, that there's a fee, but every other year CFP professionals pay uh, an annual fee to help maintain the certification, but you don't have to submit your CE uh, only uh, every other year, not uh, every year. Uh, the annual certification fee is $325. $145 of that goes directly to the expenses of the public awareness campaign. Uh, and given the difference in the requirements every other year, there's also a different schedule of notices that you, the CFP professionals will see. In renewal years when CE and other requirements are due, we will start sending reminders three to four months uh, in advance of the expiration date. In years when you're only paying, the fee reminders will go out closer to the expiration date, about six to eight weeks. We've also made some changes in the online renewal process to help make sure no one accidentally misses one of the requirements. Our previous system allowed you to complete the requirements in any order, and we found that we had some people who would complete the CE and pay the fee, but uh, there was, was a glitch along the way, or they'd do the requirements in another order and miss one of them, uh, and so we, we think we've cleaned that up. We hope to see a, uh, uh, a smaller number of late fee assessments, but clearly if there's a problem, give us a call on our stakeholder services function at CFP Board and we'll, we'll work that out, but I know we've had a glitch there. I also want to give everyone a heads up about an upcoming comment period uh, related to the renewal. Alan shared that some of our enforcement related comment periods will be announced later this year. We will also be announcing a comment period on proposed amendments to CFP Board's uh, continuing education standards. Now, in 2011, we strengthened the ethics CE standards with the requirement of an additional uh, section in the C ethics CE, and those we added uh, learning objectives and instructor eligibility requirements. This year, our Council on Education and others have been taking a comprehensive look at all of our continuing education standards. The board just reviewed some of the recommendations that resulted from this review, and we will be releasing a proposed amendments for uh, review and comments. So uh, uh, take a look and be watching for those. Some of the other designations uh, have an exam uh, 
person uh, have a, some of the other designations require you to actually take another exam, but for us it's the continuing education that is uh, assuring ongoing competency. Right. We had a question already from um, one of our uh, participants whose first name is Alan, and he asked about the CE requirements, uh, suggesting that currently they are inadequate. Um, uh, obviously, the CE requirements that uh, now apply uh, are pretty much unchanged from when they were first introduced in the 1990s, so I think we're all looking forward to seeing the plans to update them for, um, for the 21st century. Yeah, indeed, and so there, there will be a number of proposals that will be coming out, and uh, I think uh, uh, we will be looking for comments and feedback. Uh, the staff reviews and the board uh, then uh, will look at a summary of those comments and make adjustments before issuing the final, final uh, new requirements for CE. You know, Tim, one of the issues, uh, I think um, uh, CFP board in the past has sometimes been uh, criticized for not being as open as perhaps we might be uh, and that have not paid attention to outside feedback and input. And we've really sought over the last couple of years to, to uh, increase the openness and uh, ability to receive input and actually act on it when we get it. Right, thanks. Um, well, we've already covered an awful lot of ground today. Uh, I think we now have approximately a half an hour left in this program. I think now would be a good time to turn the program over to questions submitted by uh, our listeners. We received uh, a few questions uh, in advance, and um, uh, just to get things uh, underway, um, Alan, uh, one of those questions was uh, how many CFP professionals are there at this time? According to the latest count, there are exactly 66,767 That's in the U.S. Uh, and that's rankly an increase of more than 2,500 from the beginning of 2012. Yeah, thank you. If you go outside the U.S., as you're aware, you know, there are actually more than 100,000 certificates outside the U.S. Actually, I don't have a precise number for you, but it's over 140,000 uh, certificates altogether in the world. And the number outside the U.S., and there are 23 other countries around the world where the CFP credential is, uh, is uh, offered and, uh, and uh, where CFP certification takes place. Uh, altogether, the, the total number of CFP certificates outside the United States is now greater than it is within the United States. That's a great feat. It is a world reservation, and it needs to be. Uh, there have been a number of questions early on that were submitted in advance that uh, uh, went to the question of uh, SEC regulation, uh, the SRO, uh, and I'm just wondering uh, for any of you, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say about that or, or uh, is there anything, uh, anything further? I don't see any questions coming from the audience that I don't think we've addressed, but maybe there's something else you'd like to say. Well, I, a couple things I would uh, just add. First of all, uh, as we talk 913, Section 913 gives the SEC the authority to uh, implement a fiduciary standard for broker-dealers. Uh, we've been meeting with the SEC. It's, it's been held up somewhat uh, uh, due to uh, strong opposition of the fiduciary standard from the insurance industry. We're hopeful that the SEC will begin rulemaking soon. And uh, we're meeting with the SEC staff on a, on, a, on a fairly regular basis and, in fact, have meetings set up later this month uh, to, to talk with them. I think the only thing other, the other thing that I would add, uh, we talked about SRO investment advisor oversight. Uh, we would like the help of our listeners to uh, support a, uh, the, the policy positions and uh, we have a tool on our website that allows you to contact your representative by phone or email to express your opposition to the, the uh, uh, Investment Advisor Oversight Bill of 2012. Just look for the legislative action alert messages on the website, and so uh, we, we would be pleased to have that input. Well, the board is, strongly feels that financial planning as a profession to be a recognized profession needs to be regulated. And the question of how, we agree the SEC is the appropriate measure, but 
regulation is important to a profession and as a growing profession, we think that whatever comes out for our benefit of our stakeholders is going to be beneficial to the public. Right. Uh, there is a follow-on question about the um, about the fee that uh, would be uh, the preference of the CFP board and uh, the uh, Financial Planning Coalition partners. Uh, the question uh, is whether it would be a percentage of assets under management, a flat fee, or some other arrangement. Has there been any proposal made about that? Tim, there really hasn't. Uh, clearly, there would need to be some a way of allocating the additional expenses, and uh, but there's been nothing to date that uh, about how specifically uh, the fee would be determined. I think the, the key point, though, is when you look at the total cost of, of uh, increasing oversight at the SEC versus either a, a, a brand new S, uh, SRO or, or FINRA, our independent research conducted by the Boston Consulting Group says the cost would be twice as much. So uh, I think that's the key takeaway there. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else, Nancy or Alan, on that? Um, uh, Shifting uh, questions to um, the topic of SRO, again, this is obviously a very uh, 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 engaging topic for many people in our profession. Here's, uh, I guess I'd call it an observation rather than a question uh, from uh, Aaron, um, and it is, does anyone else share my two biggest concerns uh, about the SEC becoming our SRO? namely that it, a public perception that primarily consists of Wall Street uh, cronies that fail to adequately protect investors from bad actors, such as Madoff. And the second observation uh, that this person is making, I can't tell whether Aaron is a man or a woman, so I'm not using the pronoun. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's not identified whether Aaron is a man or a woman here. Uh, the second observation is about the SEC, an affinity toward the wirehouse model, or at a minimum, a lack of sufficient understanding of how independent advisors actually work with their clients. So these are Aaron's observations. Any comments, agreements, disagreements with those? Well, first of all, the, the, the proposal that we are advocating, that the Financial Planning Coalition is advocating, is not that the SEC creates an SRO, but that we're just enhancing the current SEC authority that they have. So it's a matter of increasing uh, examinations from once every 11 years of pro on average to once every four years. So that's the... Uh, uh, that is the uh, proposal that's in place. Regarding the SEC bent toward wire houses, I think, uh, I think we, we would start with an admission that there's no perfect regulation, uh, and I think people should think in terms of uh, the value of keeping SC, uh, investment advisor oversight at the SEC that has 70 plus years of experience in uh, examining investment advisors, understands enforcement of, uh, of standards-based uh, 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 procedures versus a FINRA and talk about a wirehouse uh, bias mm. uh, if they were the SEC or if they were the SRO overseeing. Uh, investment advisors, I think it would be even more so. Right. Thank you. I guess I would only hope that whatever regulation comes down is as fair and as equitable as the enforcement process that the CFP board currently uses to look at our certificates if they violate any of our code of ethics. Right. Thank you very much, Alan, for that. By the way, Aaron um, sent in a follow-on message uh, identifying <laughs> him, himself <laughs> as a dude. <laughs> as a dude. <laughs> Okay, Aaron, thank you. Uh, there are a number of questions about, about continuing education. It's interesting. Uh, so first of all, from Jay, uh, I assume Jay is a dude, uh, how, are the C, how are the CE sponsors selected and monitored? Well, that's a, a, a great question, Jay. And, and when you say dude, I'm figuring they're from California. Is that I, the term no, that you get? That's the yeah. West Coast we, do, we do use dude here. Yes, yeah, you do. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the process is uh, is somewhat self-selecting. If uh, anybody uh, 
either nonprofit or for-profit organizations can become a sponsor of CE. And so there's an annual uh, enrollment process to do that. And then each program that is uh, accepted by CFP Board is submitted and reviewed uh, for compliance with our standards. One of the things that uh, folks may not be aware of that we want to encourage, and that is many folks have uh, participate in study groups. Some of these have quite extensive, quite formal programs, and we have a couple study groups that actually submit their uh, programs for CE credit, but they, they can qualify assuming they meet the standards just like uh, any other program. So if you're not doing that, you may want to think about that. Okay. And here's a question from uh, Kelly, who is at a CE sponsor, Charles Schwab. Uh, quite the question is, how soon will you communicate changes to these requirements to CE sponsors? Are we planning, tr we are planning training for 2013. It would be good to know if there are new requirements that would significantly change our training focus. Uh, Kelly, is Kelly a dude? Do we know? I think Kelly is probably not a dude. <laughs> yeah. That's my guess. You're about to get feedback. Um, we would expect within the next uh, uh, four to six weeks that we would have the initial proposals out for uh, uh, comment and review, and it would be uh, any any change would at the earliest be re approved in November of 2012 to take a, a place uh, and to be effective in 2013. I don't think there's going to be, I don't know, and I don't want to well, speak for the board, I don't know that there'll be drastic change. Well, I think Kelly's talking about two different things. The cost of producing CE and what the board will accept or not accept, yeah. that is not planning on changing. Yeah. What may change is what would be accepted for CE credits. Right. And that's what's going out for public comment after our task force looks at that. that. That was expressed at the board. Uh, we spent a lot of time, as a matter of fact, discussing alternatives to CE and additions to CE and requirements that whether it should be 100% in a particular area or spread out over a number of areas. And all that was discussed, and most of that would go off a comment. Okay. So thank you, Alan, for that clarification. And I invite Kelly to uh, uh, give us a follow up note if that did not respond to her question. Uh, but I'm going to change the, change the subject for a moment to go on to some questions about the um, uh, consumer awareness campaign. And the first of those is, uh, what is the rationale for targeting the mass affluent market segment? Is it just the population? Uh, and then this person goes on to observe, and this is from Chris, another ambiguous name. I don't know if this is a <laughs> will be the next. <laughs> <laughs> you people should put a little paren <laughs> after your name. It's going to be very helpful <laughs> so I can use the right pronoun. Um, I find our services are more beneficial to the affluent high net worth and ultra high net worth segments. Um, and then there's a follow-up question, but let, let, let's see if someone would care to answer that question first about the mass affluent market. I'd be happy to, to take that. It was really research-based. Uh, first of all, we have CFP professionals who are serving uh, all demographic markets. And so Chris uh, obviously is focusing on the high net worth and ultra high net worth. Uh, but the, the target market was really uh, focused based on research that we conducted. First of all, we talked with focus groups and conducted research with investors and the public at large. And the results of that research uh, showed that uh, the folks who fit that mass affluent, that's from 100,000 to a million dollars of investable assets, were the group that was uh, largely uh, felt as though a CFP professional could help them. Now, when we're buying media, we're buying, uh, as, as Nancy said, we're buying Fox News, MSNBC, we're buying broad media. You can reach higher and lower. There's spill on either side of that in, in the advertising terms. So that was, uh, it was research based on consumers and where they thought they could benefit from the value of financial planner. And interestingly, it was also based on research of CFP professionals and the average CFP professional, well, we know uh, the average new client has in the neighborhood of three to $500,000 uh, um, investable assets as a minimum. So that target seemed to fit well. Okay. 
thank you. Uh, and by the way, we also heard from Chris. Chris is also a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure we know this. Okay, again, friends after your names, please. M or F. Um, uh, or D. <laughs> D for dude. Oh, D. <laughs> <laughs> this is California, but I was having a hard time figuring out what D was going to stand. Okay, so here's a question um, on a new topic uh, about the bankruptcy uh, uh, indication, uh, and it's a statement. Are you aware that the publicized from Larry? Uh, not too. That's not too ambiguous. Uh, are you aware that the publicizing of CFPs who have filed bankruptcy has resulted? Uh, Larry is suggesting has resulted with the legal community searching out via internet uh, clients of those planners. Thus, there is an implication that those planners have caused harm to their clients when in fact there's no necessary correlation. Um, and also on this topic, why does the CFP board feel that sending out a press release with the names of planners who have filed bankruptcy is a good idea when the ABA, the American Bar Association, does not send out public news releases on their members who have filed for bankruptcy. So, first of all, were those questions and considerations uh, undertaken when you uh, uh, adopted this policy? And can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, they were under consideration. Can we talk about it? The first answer to the question is no, I wasn't aware of that. But to go beyond that, uh, the board felt that it was extremely important that the public be aware. Uh, the, the CFP's disclosure to its clients or prospective clients is in our code of ethics. So in any case, a client or a prospective client of a certificate would have to be made aware by that certificate of a prior bankruptcy. We felt the public's interest was so strong in this area since we are a 501c3 organization and one of our main missions is to protect the public that over and above what some other organizations may choose to do or not, we felt it was important for public information that that awareness was out there. So I think we took a bold step in doing that, even though some people might not agree. You know, and the other thing is, I'm not sure we want to use the American Bar Association attorneys with all due respect to our friends in the legal profession as the, as the measure by which, uh, you know, we benchmark ourselves. A question about uh, the advertising campaign, the public awareness campaign, and the question goes to uh, have you considered making the advertising ads smaller to accommodate our local markets, which I assume means small local markets. I don't know if they mean uh, the uh, size or what? in length or size. What, what do we think there? Do we have any sense? I don't. Well, I, the, the, I was hoping you could interpret the question. I'm not <laughs> sure I understand what this person means by so small. If they mean shorter, we the, probably the answer this is, is from uh, Michael. Um, well, the toolkit includes a number of different options for the print ads. Also, uh, for it was this Larry. No, this is Michael. 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 For Michael, I would also encourage you to take a look at some of the flash ads because the flash ads, if you know, can be adopted uh, adapted for his website. So I'm not sure exactly what he means, but the toolkit is pretty thorough. And if you haven't been there yet, we'd encourage you to go there. Uh, well, uh, Michael is clarifying. He's referring to newspaper ads. So um, we have. Um, I, I haven't considered that, and so we'll take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions here that haven't been covered by the ground that we've already touched upon. Oh, here's one about state advisors. Would state registered advisors be exempt from any additional fee related to SEC oversight of advisors, or would the SEC's new mandate be comprehensive across all ad advisors? You, you know the the investment the 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 Bacchus bill the so-called Bacchus bill the Investment Advisor Oversight Act of 2012 as it was introduced and upon which there was a hearing last month had state advisors in uh, the legislation. However, there's you know the there we, we understand that uh, Congress is taking another look at that bill because it was great. Uh, um, 
objection on the part of the states for uh, the federal uh, imposition into the oversight of, of their advisors. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Nancy or Alan, on that? Um, see if I can. Um, here's, here's a question that goes to initial certification, I believe, and it's from Alan. And uh, not the Alan that's across the table from me, but from an Alan who's on the webinar. And it uh, asks, will testing be offered for candidates at a proctor center on an ongoing basis, uh, like other exams, at a testing center, for example, as opposed to a particularly scheduled, particularly proctored uh, examination event at sites? So would it be, in a sense, available on demand? Well, we've looked into that. And uh, let me let you, Kevin, address that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, what Alan's talking about, just as you said, Alan, is uh, he's asking about computer-based testing. And we continue to explore that. There are a number of, of issues to converting to computer-based testing. I, I think the way I would answer that question, Tim, is it's not a matter of if we will be doing computer-based testing. It's a more of a matter of when we do that. And, but uh, it's still, uh, it's not in the next year to 18 months. It's, it's, it's going to be a little further down the road. You know, it, it, interestingly, the CFA uh, examination for the Chartered Financial Analyst still is a paper and pencil examination. They give it on one day all around the world. They fly them into China and take them out with one person takes them in and out of each testing site. So uh, it is the wave of the future, but there are, are uh, some issues associated with the implementation that we want to make sure we get right. Uh, back on the topic of uh, regulation and the possibility of uh, an SRO and the possibility of that SRO being uh, FINRA, a question uh, from Patrice, and uh, I know we could spend many hours on this, but here is the question. Explain what FINRA actually does now. Not everyone is as well informed about that as obviously the people around this table. Uh, many of us don't really know what FINRA does. <laughs> well, as we look at me. <laughs> well, you're a FINRA <laughs> arbiter. Actually, yes, and I've been on FINRA's board of governance for local committees and so forth and so on. Uh, and I'm amazed that I'm not sure what FINRA does either. <laughs> so it's a, uh, wrong answer. No, wrong answer. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm being honest now. It's, I know that's hard to believe, but no, FINRA's job is to regulate the uh, broker-dealer industry primarily. And that's the job that we see them doing. They're also, when they have NASDAQ and doing other things, they're regulating the trading and the orchestration of any investment activity, any, inv any uh, investment uh, banking activities are related to that. But as it affects most of the independent financial advisors that are registered with a broker-dealer, uh, their responsibility is primarily to make sure that the advisor is doing the right thing by the client from a suitability standpoint and that the investments that are being presented are appropriate based on the suitability of the particular client and it's the firm's responsibility to oversight that suitability. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Um, I think on uh, some other topics here, uh, one is, again, on the topic of uh, continuing education, and I think it's just a, f uh, a factual uh, question from Peter. Are the 30 hours of CE still do every two years? In other words, I believe Peter's asking if the current requirement is still 30 hours every two years. That's the easiest answer there is, yes. Yes, the answer is yes to that, and the, and the, the next follow-on comment is it's under consideration whether that should change. Exactly. That's part of what's going to be going out as far as for comment. Okay. Thank you. And I am trying to see if there are any additional questions that we haven't uh, somehow addressed here. Um, I think there's one observation here from someone that looks like he, I believe it's a he, is looking for guidance about how to make a complaint about another CFP certificate, and I don't know that that is exactly relevant to, I'm not going to go into the details of the fact pattern that this person has presented here. <laughs> it's quite detailed fact pattern, but the question really is, how does one go about registering a complaint uh, with regard to a CFP certificate? 
you can either go online, cfp.net, or uh, call our office and uh, talk with one of our compliance analysts. So, okay. And I'm trying to recall now where that, oh, it's coming from uh, Michael. And so, Michael, I hope that that responds to the gist of your question without going into the details. Um, so let's see, anything else here? Um, someone is observing, this is Patrice again, that it's, that the, man, the difference in the mandate between the SEC and FINRA is, uh, the current mandates between the two organizations is uh, unclear. And is there anything further that we can say that would help people understand the role that the SEC plays, its authority, and the authority derived or otherwise that FINRA has? Is there some way to help us understand those things better? I just start and make a general comment that uh, the SEC provides generally investment advisor oversight versus FINRA providing broker dealer oversight generally. And then from care, there, Kevin, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm talking about how FINRA was created and the fact that the SEC has oversight over FINRA. Certainly, and, and FINRA, as I think most people know, started as the National Association of Securities Dealers. It is the uh, industry essentially regulating itself. I think the major difference that uh, if, if people haven't uh, operated in both, uh, under both regulatory regimes, uh, FINRA it, uh, enforces a suitability standard based on rules and the SEC enforces a fiduciary standards based on principles. And so that is one of the other key differentiators. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. We are now just about out of time, and so I'll ask each of our guests if they'd like to uh, share any parting thoughts with our audience. I'll begin with you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I appreciate you being here and moderating this as well as you always do. I hope that everyone in the CFP professional community values how far we've come. When we talk about the profession, we always talk in comparison to professions like accounting, law, medicine, and each of these professions are hundreds of years ahead of us. And yet we've made noticeable gains during the 40 years since we've had the concept of financial planning as a profession. We've had progress to be made, but we have more progress to be made yet still. Uh, it's important, as I said before, if we're going to be a recognized universal profession, we need to do it right, do it well, do it professionally, and be regulated in such a way that the public will benefit from what we do. It's the high standards we set and represents an important role in us leading the way to that goal. And I really thank everyone today for your contributions, because without them, it would make it much harder for the board to do their job. Thank you, Alan. Nancy, anything? I couldn't agree more with Alan. Uh, there is increased consumer demand for CFP professionals. There's continued interest among financial professionals in attaining CFP certification. And the certification and the high standards it represents are as strong as ever. We've seen how our public awareness campaign is already making a measurable impact. And we know that when people are aware of what CFP certification means, it then changes their perceptions of planning and increases their likelihood to seek out a CFP professional. So once again, I encourage all of you to consider what steps you can take to help increase awareness of the value of CFP certification in your communities, and we will do the same here at the CFP board. Thank you, Nancy. Kevin? You know, I also want to encourage folks to get involved with CFP board. In recent years, the opportunities available have increased dramatically. You know, I came here five years ago, and the first impression that I had was how fortunate we are as an organization to have people who are willing to spend time away from their business and their family to contribute to the profession of financial planning as a whole and specifically uh, to CFP board. We've brought together task forces and working groups focused on different topics, helped organize financial planning days, events uh, across the country involving literally hundreds of CFP professionals, all of whom are volunteering. And we have ongoing exam development and uh, an enforcement process that requires substantial and meaningful input by the CFP professional community. So you can visit our website, uh, www.cfp.net 
slash volunteers uh, and complete an application to be considered for volunteering, uh, you'll be notified then when opportunities uh, come available in your area. I also want to encourage you to stay connected through social media. We have social media channels in place that allow us to share uh, with you the latest information from CFP Board in the community. You'll find links to articles uh, that feature or were written by your colleagues from around the country as well as messages from our public awareness campaign. It's easy to share those messages with your network and we invite you to share those with us. Thank you all, uh, all of you who participated today and thank you everyone who's in our audience. A recording of this presentation will be posted to the CFP Board's website in the next week or so, and the CFP Board will follow up with those who ask questions that we didn't uh, have an opportunity to address during the broadcast. The CFP Board welcomes your comments regarding this program and your suggestions for future programs at webinars at cfpboard.org. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Goodbye.